Well, it's an enormous pleasure to be, and an honor really, to be in conversation with Jean Baquet. Um, I live just 30 or so miles north of New York, and I'm not sure I could get through breakfast without you in your paper, actually. So, yeah, that, that is for sure. So, Dean is executive editor of the, New, of the New York Times, has been so since 2014, I believe. Grew up in New Orleans, favorite place of mine. Uh, and you actually, you, um, you went to Columbia to read English, my university. But you couldn't have liked it very much because you <laughs> left, you know. You dropped out. You dropped him out. For Dean essentially has been working in what might be called the kind of royalty of serious American journalism. Because you dropped out to work for the Times Picayune in your city, then went on to um, did you Chicago Tribune after that? Chicago Tribune. So uh, uh, then to the New York Times as national editor or working First metropolitan. Time, a reporter for a okay, yes. reporter. Um, and then the LA Times. A Chicago Tribune was when you um, uh, were awarded a Pulitzer for exposing, exposing corruption. It's, it'll come as a shock to all of you to know there was corruption in Chicago politics, right? It was harder, but, it was harder uh, than it sounds. It yeah, than it sounds. Yeah. Exposing corruption is it's sort of, um, anyway, uh, a richly deserved Pulitzer. Um, and then the LA Times, where you, um, were you nominated, I think, for another Pulitzer there? Too? Um, that was at the New York Times. Oh, the New York yeah. Times. Yeah. Okay, okay. And, um, and, um, and then back to the New York Times as managing editor, I think. Is that right? Yeah. And then, yeah. And, um, so, um, so hence the, the sort of central importance, really, of your vocation. So very naturally... The first question I want to put, well, the first thing I want to say, I think, not so much in the form of a question, is that Trump may be not invariably great for America or the world, but he sure must be good for the New York Times, for business, as it were, for the... You know, um, yes and no. Yes, his, his election provided this initial, it provided two very important things. First, of course, it provided a huge circulation and subscription boost. Yeah, Second, at the time, he keeps on calling you the failing New York right. Times. That's right. The more he says that, the better the more you'll we circulate. Exactly, right. yeah. but, the, but the second thing he provided, I think, was a clarity of purpose. If you, it's, it's hard to remember now, but American newspapers, and I suspect newspapers here too, felt a real in in inferiority complex throughout the 80s and 90s. We were laying people off. We were cutting. We didn't quite know how to embrace this new technology. And all of a sudden, after the election of Donald Trump and the realization of Americans that there was a purpose to newspapers, all of a sudden, instead of, instead of newspaper editors walking across the landscape with their heads bowed, all of a sudden, people were stopping us and saying, this is the biggest story of a lifetime, and we need you to cover it. Um, so, so he helped in those ways. Here's the way he does not help. <clears throat> I think in the long run, the constant drumbeat of attack, criticism, fake news, enemy of the state, undermining the, the, the most important independent news organizations in America, in the end, that's not good for us. But how can you, I mean, if we take a bit arbitrarily the mobilization of votes in the midterm elections mm -hmm. last year, um, the signs are, and you'll absolutely correct me if I'm wrong, that. Um, that calling truth fake news and the mainstream media, and this has been going on a long, long time, of course, essentially on right-wing talk radio, which maybe we'll, we'll talk about a little later, which was an extraordinarily awakening memory for me when I first heard Rush Limbaugh and Sean Hannity. Um, but the, the sort of the evidence from that midterm election was that while it may make the core base of Trump, which is about a third of the, yeah, of the right. vote, right, has it actually, you know, is, is there kind of uh, independent votes, swing votes in the middle of the country? Yeah. Um, do they really think, yeah. you know, that the mainstream media are no longer to be trusted? I mean, so see, in my, in my head, there are, and this is very oversimplistic, and if there are any pollsters in the audience, you're going to throw things at me. In my head, there are three groups of American voters, and to my mind, three groups of American readers. 
they are the very staunch Donald Trump supporters. Then there are the people who can't stand Donald Trump. I do think there's a group of people, remember a lot of people who voted for Donald Trump voted for Barack Obama first. There are people who vote for Donald, it, it's a mistake to think that Donald Trump's support is made up of people just in the middle of the country, as you know. There are people in Greenwich, Connecticut, in New York. Most Republicans support Donald Trump. I, I gotta believe that, the, the, first off, those are people, I want everybody to read the New York Times. I particularly want people who are independent-minded to read the New York Times. So I, I do think that when he attacks us relentlessly, I fear it hurts us with those people. And one of my most important jobs in the coming year is to convince those people that when he calls us fake news that, that they're wrong, that he's wrong, and to convince those people that I have something to offer that they really need. How, I mean, um, how are you going to do that in, in terms of, I mean, do you change your tune, change your tone? I mean, have you, you know, have you sat down with your fellow editors, really, and thought, and thought how you do that? Um, it's, it's much of what we talk about. Um, we won't change our tune. If, you, if by our tune you mean the core bedrock beliefs of the New York Times, which is that we are an independent institution with a global perspective, that's not going to change. We will be more transparent with readers. I think one of the great sins of journalism, period, over the last 40 years is we were not transparent. We took readers for granted. We got most of our money from advertisers. And we didn't reach out to readers. And we didn't think about the needs of readers. And I don't mean slavishly. I mean think about the needs of readers and meet them where they are. I don't think we told readers, here's how we do our business. If, if, if I want you to believe me, I'm going to show you how I got the story. If I want you to believe me, I'm going to show you Maggie Haberman. I'm going to show you what she looks like. I'm going to show you Rukmini Kalamachi. I'm going to make sure you know them. And I'm going to make sure you know they're honorable people who are working really hard to get it right. Mm. And, uh, and you feel like that has, can you tell if that's actually had an effect out of um, you know, uh, there is the daily, and you know and that is yes, uh, really daily, that daily does discuss about how news stories come about. The daily and reaches an audience we never reached before. It's a young. Do you want audience. to talk about what it is a bit? The daily is our is our daily podcast, which, which largely consists of um, New York Times reporters being interviewed by the now famous host Michael Barbaro about the news of the day. Mm. And what they do is they talk about the news of the day in a nitty gritty way. They don't just say there was an impeachment hearing today. I covered it. They talk about how they covered it. They talk about how they approached it. They talk about how they think about it. I, I just got to believe that the people who listen to that, and this may be me being an idealist, but I'll, I'll, I'll wear that hat. I just think they, if people see how we work and how we try and who we are and the mechanics of it, that that's convincing. Um. Can I, I read you something? Um, because I think the point you're making about actually being transparent and showing the mechanics of how a story comes to pass and, and that actually adding to your credibility, um, I, 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 I deeply wish that were the case. Um, uh, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure it necessarily... Um, I'm not sure it necessarily prevails against the instincts of tribal allegiance. But the, the question I wanted to kind of um, I extend from that point is whether you do that, or whether or not this issue of capturing the uncommitted center is best done by sustaining uh, a sort of um, a, a deserved reputation for objectivity, for a kind of... Um, uh, I, I won't call it both sidesism, but a sort of sense, right? Or whether actually in a s unique situation we're in now, and I do think it is in my lifetime, historically unique in this country as well as where I live, north of New York, whether or not actually you should loosen your corsets a bit about being partisan. Let me read you what Hannah Arendt, you pro I'm sure you know this, Dean, the, the famous passage from her interview with... Roger Herrera, which you can find, it, it, ladies and gentlemen, if you're interested in an online New York Review of Books, um, about lies. And 
She writes, she said, the moment we no longer have a free press, anything can happen. Um, what makes it possible for a totalitarian or any other dictatorship to rule is that people are not informed. How can you have an opinion if you are not informed? If everybody always lies to you, the consequence is, the consequence is not that you believe the lies, rather that nobody believes anything any longer. Um, and she goes on to say, it's because lies by the very nature keep on changing. And it struck me that, that it, you know, the, 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 the FT, or your paper, the flag we run up the mast is a kind of noble, but now rather old and tattered one, namely that knowledge is virtue, that information will prevail, or as Jefferson said, truth will prevail if left to herself, unless by human interposition sort of interfered with. Um, and it used to be also thought that the more information we have, the more, the better citizens we become. The problem, it seems to me now, is that we're drowning in information. And that, that in, instead of simply being an engine of information, newspapers should maybe, in the name of sorting truth and lies, be gatekeepers and guardians of the distinction between truth and lies. And I know you had a debate on the New York Times about using the word. See, I, I actually agree with that. I don't, I don't think that being independent or striving for some sort of objectivity means that you're a passive recipient of, of the events of the day. It means you're a chronicler of the events of the day, but it, does, it also means you do investigative reporting. It also means that you go out and ask really hard questions of people in power. I, don't, I, don't, I guess I don't fully uh, uh, accept that being quote-unquote objective, not, not my favorite word, but I'll use it, um, independent means sort of a passive attending a press conference, coming back and writing it. I think you... It includes attending a press conference, coming back, and spending the day trying to figure out whether the person who spoke at the press conference told the truth. But, but I also would argue that the fact that we're awash in so much information, that there's so much stuff flowing in, much of it not believable, actually should force us, institutions like mine, to be even more gatekeepers, to be even more to even more stick to our guns of independence. Because I think my, my contract with the reader is, I will give you the facts, I will tell you what happened, and guess what? If you don't believe all that other stuff, I'm gonna try to convince you to believe me. Yeah. Um, I mean, you have a serious fact-checking, I mean, you have some yeah. fact-checking edi ed ed editors yes. who do really yeah. nothing else. So. Uh, do, you, do you feel you're ahead of the game, really, about, you know, soft facts and... I mean, you, you, you were, you know, there was, there was a debate, wasn't there, in the Times about how often you use the word lies, and you took, and I'm sure you, you well, you probably still take a, a, a conservative with a very small C. We, we were the first one to use it. Oh, really? Is that yeah. right? Yeah, oh, no, we but were the Washington first... Washington Post had its Pinocchio. Do you know yeah. about Washington Post <laughs> Pinocchios? You know, it, it yeah, uh, it has... It, it, it has a Pinocchio of scoring for the Trump and the administration telling lies. Well, we he apparently told 67 last week about yeah. Ukraine. And soon we were the <laughs> no, we were the first ones to use the word lie on the front page of the New York Times with reference Which to Donald story? Trump. It was the story about his, his insistence that or he didn't believe Barack Obama was born in oh, the United States. Right. By the way, the reason I don't want to use lie all the time is because nobody ever remembers why we use the word. They just remembered that we use the word. So whenever I speak, people say, you, you guys use the word lie, right? I don't want to be remembered for using the word lie. I want to be remembered for the lie I called out. That's, that's, that's the difference. And are we ahead of the curve on dealing with, you know, the lies of the world? Are we ahead of the curve with dealing with the, the president's attacks? Of course not. Um, of course not. I mean, we, we are confronting a, a, a world where falsehoods, you know, are, are all across the internet, 
where a handful of, poli well, not a handful, many politicians in the United States and elsewhere have found they can get away with, with outright falsehoods um, and with just sort of saying that that door is not open, even if it's clearly open. Do I think we're ahead of that? No, of course not. No. No. Mm. I think I, that's the big job of the next however many years. No, I don't think we're ahead of it. Yeah. I mean, p part of the, 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 this is a more melancholy and elegiac note, I suppose. I mean, we've lived in a world of print since the invention of the printing press, really. Um, which, I mean, certainly wasn't impervious to the notion that outrageous propaganda, particularly during the Reformation, could be kind of committed by Protestants and Catholics mutually. But there was a sort of sense, I suppose, it crystallized thinks of Milton's Areopagitica and his, you know, impassioned polemic against censorship. There was a sense that, that actually the, the in, empirical method would allow people to accept actually when evidence suggested something was true. Um, and, you know, the heroic politicians of the 19th century really more or less, you know, that was, that was a premise from which they started. But now we're living, we're living in a world really of troll farms and, oh, okay. Um, Better? Thank you. Okay, we're living in a world of troll farms and cyborg bot herders. And um, there's this sort of sense, actually, that people look to the news. I mean, younger generations seem to get it most from WhatsApp groups, really, not even from Twitter any longer. But, um, but there's a sense, actually, in which you're looking for news to reinforce your tribal allegiance, really. Um, so I, I'm just wondering whether this long, epic period of many centuries, really, mm -hmm. in, which, in which print ultimately would arbitrate between yeah. what was evidentially so, and you would assent to it, even if it didn't conform to your opinion, or whether now the hunt and the money is on opinion that reinforce your yeah. tribal belief. So first, I'm, gonna, I'm probably going to sound... Um, and nobody who knows me will believe this. I'm probably going to sound completely naive. Um, um, part of that is because I love newspapers, and and I and I think and I actually think of them as tremendous forces for good. I think that the electronic age we're in is significantly better than the print age. Um, I think partly because we can show our work. If, if, some, if somebody delivers an amazing report, an amazing story, it's just easier digitally to show what it looked like for you to talk the, to the reporter. I think the very fact that we, I mean, we created a unit to do forensics video where we actually go out, collect all of the available video in the world, and tell a story that couldn't be told otherwise. So I, I, would, I would hate for people to walk away thinking, that the travails of the internet age, which are considerable, outweigh the, the amazing stuff. I, I would also add, yes, it reinforces tribalism. Yes, people can read whatever they want to, but, I've used this example a lot, but I'll use it again, the transgender kid who lives in Austin, Texas, who thinks he's all by himself, can find a transgender kid who lives in London who thinks he's all by himself. And that's another example of people being able to sort of find their own. And I, yeah, but a neo-Nazi can do that as well, too. That's, no, that's, that's right. I get it. But, but I still think that the story of, I mean, I grew up in New Orleans. I had access to, we can't romanticize the way things were. I, w I grew up in New Orleans, and as a kid, the newspapers that I read when I was a very small child um, still use the word Negro in their, in their classified advertising. Mm -hmm. um, they still reinforce the laws where, where there were certain neighborhoods black people couldn't live in. Um, those newspapers are much better today than they were then. If I were the same kid in the era today, I could read The Guardian. I could read The New York Times. I would not have to, I wouldn't be stuck with the same newspaper that I read, which 
in the, 19, the late 1950s and early 1960s wasn't very good. So I'm not, I'm not in denial about the travails, far from it. In fact, part of my life is going to be spent, you know, pushing back against the bad stuff. I just don't want us to lose sight of the good stuff, the considerable good stuff, because it's going to make us sort of hunker down, get defensive, over-regulate, and, and just sort of throw out the good with the bad. And I think that's a mistake. Mm. Um, I could tell I, 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 could tell no, I convinced I would, no, no, you. <laughs> no, I'm a little bit more pessimistic than you, I think, actually. But, but I see a gleam in your eyes, and it's very, it's very, <laughs> no, it's very, it's very heartening. Um, but I wonder if you'd have that gleam if you were trying to work in Budapest, for example. So, I mean, my... my but don't uh, forget, by the way, la last <laughs> thing. So, One reason the Arab Spring started sure. was because people in, in that region got to read things about their rulers that they would not have gotten to read had there not been an internet where they couldn't read what the Guardian and others reported about what their rulers were doing. So. Yeah. Well, we engaged in a great and mighty and uh, struggle. You know, it is kind of, I mean, I can't remember who it was who said the most important thing is um, not which armies win, but which stories win right. now. Right. And you can actually, this is a, you know, um, a, a Chinese preoccupation. You can kind of, and certainly a preoccupation of, <laughs> of the current ruler of the universe, Vladimir Putin, except where we hold fast and strong. So that you can actually hollow out democracies, really, yeah. by, by um, <clears throat> you know, infiltration of, of swamping, swamping the web, really, with so many alternative opinions and soft facts. Mm -hmm. uh, People, people lose faith. Sure. So I suppose the, the, the payoff, the hardest question, because I'm not sure about it, seen worldwide, not just in a kind of British or an American context, is how much does the population of the world care about a free press? The Victor Orban bet when he, you know, when he praised illiberal democracy and told us that liberal democracy was, had gone, and, and it was a kind of thing of the past, was the bet that what people really cared about immediately was, I suppose, health, but also essentially the management of the economy, the delivery of consumer goods, and above all, their <clears> sense <throat> of collective, nationalist, ferocious self-worth. Yeah. And the free press and the independence of the judiciary were these kind of intellectual luxuries, really, yeah. which were of no consequences except to a small elite. Yeah. But I think, that's the, I think that's the leadership. I do think, I, I honestly believe, and again, um, <laughs> I honestly believe that there in fact is a clamoring for a free press. I was at a conference today. One of the reasons I'm, in, I'm here is because we had, there was a trust conference this morning. And there was a kid who, who um, fled from North Korea when he was a teenager. And he kept getting into trouble because one of the things he did was to take his computer, get under the, the sheets, and watch South Korean television. And over time, he started to hide and just watch more news. And when it became clear that that was happening, he was tortured, and eventually he realized he had to leave the country. I think we shouldn't, we shouldn't confuse the, the rulers, Orban, with what I honestly think is a desire for a free press that I, I get that some people want the free press to tell them what, what they think they want, but the evidence that the biggest, most powerful newspapers, particularly American newspapers in the world, are gaining audience, the fact that I have, you know, the New York Times never had more than a million readers. The New York Times now has five million subscribers. That's got to tell me that there are a lot, and growing, growing in ways we never, we, we, we're almost surprised. I think that tells me that, that there's a clamor and a desire for that. And I even think, I even think Twitter and the, and, the, and the world of social media, which makes us nuts, it certainly makes me nuts a lot, is also representative of a clamoring of people to get information. They may not get it from where we want them to get it, and we've got to reckon with that, but I think they want it. They want to know stuff. They want to talk. They want to communicate. Well, they get it from... Um, yeah, it can come through links on Twitter, but increasingly they're getting it from news aggregates. Yeah, that's really. True. Yeah. And rather than, how do you feel about that? And um, you know, is, is that a right? Or, again, it seems. <laughs> no, to I want them to get it from me. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't look. 
I, I, I wear two hats, right? My, my primary hat is I want the New York Times to survive and thrive and be read and take over the journalism world and be seen as a beacon of truth and freedom. That's my first goal. I'm not there yet. Um, my second goal is for, is for all of journalism and for us to be read and for all of us to have impact. I get that the, that the giant platforms screw up my economic model, um, but I'll also point out that they're starting to pay us to give them news for the first time, which I think is a mm. big deal. But I, I, want also, I just want people to engage in journalism, period. Mm. Um, you think I'm hopeless, don't you? No, <laughs> no. And how do you get that impression? No, I, I'm being, I, absolute, no, absolutely not. I, 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 it's I think, my Southern Catholic upbringing. No, I, I think. Well, I want to ask you about that. Maybe this is the point too. I was going to say. I think you're heroically optimistic, and that's that. Uh, thank God, you know, as executive editor of the <clears> New York Times, you are really. Um, one thing one wouldn't want from an executive editor of the New York Times to be a cynic. Hope. <laughs> well, a right. cynic or a pessimist. Yeah. But tell me a bit more, because you did, I was figuring out, the first <clears> time <throat> I went to the South was in um, 1964. And I, th I think you're 12 or 14, 15 years younger than me or so on. But mm -hmm. I mean, it, it, I, when I was just doing your bio, it was just a you know, set of an announcements, but it was an extraordinary thing to kind of grow up in yeah. the South, really. And yeah. maybe particularly when you were working on New Orleans' wonderful paper. Right? Yeah. Say a bit about then yeah. your own particular struggles, and you're the first yeah. African-American to be yeah. executive editor of a great paper. Yeah. Tell us a bit about that. <clears throat> so I grew up in an all-black neighborhood in New Orleans called Treme. I went to a, an all-black Catholic grammar school, high school, um, my only encounters with white people when I was a kid were the nuns um, at St. Peter Claver, the Blessed Sacrament Sisters. So I, I actually thought that all white people would hit me on the hand with rulers. <laughs> <laughs> it took me a while, it took me years to get to get over that. Um, and the first time I got on was on an airplane or left Louisiana or Mississippi was when I went to Columbia on a scholarship. Um, I showed up at Columbia. I Columbia was, must have been very white then still. Was it was it very white. No, yeah. it was very white. Yeah. Um, and it was, it was scary because, you know, it was not New Orleans. It was New York. It was New York in the 1970s. Yeah. Um, and I sort of rolled up. Not for the faint-hearted. Not for I, the faint-hearted. No, no, and, no. I, and I, for the first year, I hated it. Um, I was intimidated by it. I found 10 other kids from the South, and I spent all my time with them. Um, I was homesick. And I started to like it after a while because I liked the classes. I, I was an English major. But I was so homesick that I ended up um, leaving, getting an internship at the afternoon paper in New Orleans and just falling in love with it. I was 19. Um, and I just thought these, <laughs> I was seeing parts of my hometown that I'd never seen before. Um, you know, I learned more about. The, the central tenets of journalism. The reason I'm idealistic is because, you know, how do you not be idealistic about a profession that took the kid I just described and showed him a wider world and it has me sitting here and it has me running the biggest newsroom in, the, in, right. the, in America and the most important newsroom, I would argue, um, in the world. And, and I think that the, that upbringing gave me a lot and one of the things it gave me that I think was most important is I always feel a little bit like an outsider looking on the other side of the glass, which to me is the exact perfect position for a journalist to be in. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sort of curious about what's on the other side of the glass. I don't necessarily want to be there all the time, but I want to look at it and I want to write about it. And I think that's, mm -hmm. you know, that's sort of how I define if I could. That, that's been important to my journey. What were the politics like but in your first two papers? I mean, in <clears throat> New Orleans and then in the very different world of, of Chicago, but... The New Orleans papers then were, were really starting to change. New Orleans was starting to change. By the right. time I got back in the early 1980s, um, the, the sort of old, sort of moneyed, ancient um, elite was starting to lose its hold on the politics very much like the elite of this country, by the way. They had made a lot of their money. It was a big port city. They made a lot of their money in cotton. United Fruit mm. had been headquartered in 
New Orleans, they were starting to lose their grip on the economics of the city. They would completely lost their grip on the politics of the city. So the newspapers were starting to loosen up. They were getting mm. better. They were getting, they were more questioning, um, though we still covered the Mardi Gras balls as if they were um, the biggest story around. Um, right, right. Um, <laughs> so it was, a, it was, a, it was, a, it was, it was actually the, and I think the thing I learned most was having spent my entire life in the city, suddenly as a reporter, I was seeing parts of the city I'd never, I grew up in the black half of the city. Suddenly I was driving around in the Garden District in uptown New Orleans and I mm. was, and I could ask, wow, I was a 19 year old kid and I could walk into the office of anybody I wanted to mm. and ask them impertinent questions. Right. And I thought, this is good. Let's, let's go because we, uh, we were both saying that we're very happy to be here, but we're missing the impeachment hearings as they're uh, coming out. Now, already Donald Trump has described, he was, yes, what a pair of angels sitting next to each other, Donald Trump and, and Erdogan yesterday. Um, did you all notice that Donald Trump not only was satisfied with, not only felt he had to say what a, quote, good friend to the Turkish people, uh, he's certainly not a good friend to free opinion and journalism in, uh, that Erdogan was, but also that he was a good friend to the Kurdish people, which is uh, um, stretching things a bit even for him. But he's already described the impeachment hearings as, quote, a hoax. He just calls anything that might affect him personally a hoax, really. So how in this, you know, on the one hand, one has a grave, solemn, defense of the Constitution. Nancy Pelosi, I thought, gave a, a, an impressive and, and serious press conference today trying to make sharper the sense that this was essentially about defending the Constitution. The word bribery, which is specifically mentioned yeah. in the impeachment clause as a cause for the possible removal of pres president, has suddenly become part of the impeaching vocabulary. Um, but how far again um, do, do you feel, maybe especially in comparison with, the, with, with Watergate, um, that America is ready to listen to, again, the solemn presentation of evidence? And I, I suppose the second question, which is, which is rather a different one, are you as shocked as I am, or maybe you're, in this case, more skeptical than I am, about the willingness of the Republican Party to become the Trump Party, to become a fully populist nationalist, I guess sitting here, it's no, no more <laughs> shocking than the Conservative Party turning itself into the Brexit yeah. Party. So mm. two questions. Though. Yeah, no, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not shocked. Um, I mean, he controls a huge percentage of the Republican Party. I mean, the Repu I mean, Republicans in America support Donald Trump. If they were the only voters, he would be president, um, again, easily. Um, they're afraid of him. He also wields power in a way that no recent president has. I mean, I mean, Mitt Romney pushed back. He went on Twitter, attacked him, attacked him publicly. This is a this is a different animal. I, to me, there's a lot. Put, put aside the differences, of which there are some, um, in the level of the alleged offense between this and Watergate. The climate is remarkably different. I mean, think of Watergate. Howard Baker, a moderate United States senator who made it clear to the world that in his mind, his legacy was more important than Richard, Nix Richard Nixon's immediate survival. There were, there were more Republican senators like that, first off. There was no Fox News. Yes. I always, I, I, I have this, um, I'm, not, I'm not a um, literary writer or a play, playwright, but I always thought if there is one in the room, my wife's a writer, but if there is one in the room, someone in the room who, um, who can imagine, picture Watergate with Fox News. Picture Watergate, what, imagine what that would have been like. John Dean's remarkable testimony, a nation riveted by the story, and then Sean Hannity comes on at night and says, look at that little twerp. Wasn't he awful? He's been against us from the very beginning. He's betraying us. It would have been a very different story. There were three television networks. There were Republicans, and as, as I said, who were moderate. And that, this climate is very different. But here's what we don't know. I don't know, think, 
we didn't know what Trump and what Donald, what the president and Rudy Giuliani had done in the Ukraine to this extent a few months ago. I don't think, I don't know what we're going to know in two months. I don't know, I don't know what the level of, of what the, where the level of allegations will go. I don't, I don't know the answer to that, and that's a big unknown. Mm. And I don't know whether it arrives, the Iowa caucuses are in February. Mm. I don't know whether it arrives before the Iowa caucuses. Half the candidates are United States senators who would have to fly back to vote. The period between now and the middle of next year will be one of the most, stay tuned, will be one of the most dramatic periods in American politics. An impeachment hearing, an election, half the candidates getting to vote, it's going to be stunning. Mm. Um, very interesting and, again, dispiriting, I think, has been, I was talking to my wife who was watching a bit, um, and um, it, it's extraordinary that the kind of, there was a kind of scuttlebutt around, I don't know where, really, on the web, that, and I, th I think it was true, some of you here may have noticed this, that there was a British complaint that, oh dear, these hearings are so dull. They quote, <laughs> I picked up on Twitter, lack pizzazz. And that is, of course, you know, the pizzazz shortage is you're all right. I, I laugh too. <laughs> but actually, there is a serious issue. And the issue, in my understanding, is this, is that Donald Trump did actually, whether it was Donald Trump or Steve Bannon, but I think it was really, it came naturally to Donald Trump as a TV reality show presenter that he realized um, at the time the rallies were going on and sober minds, including me, insofar as my mind is ever sober, said, well, these are ephemeral things. My son-in-law works on the Hillary Clinton campaign and he certainly said, rallies, schmallies, basically what counts is our algorithmic calculations about who, uh, who we've got and who we haven't. And big decisions about where you put your advertising budget actually depended on what those algorithms told you. And they told you Wisconsin's going to be fine, Michigan's going to be fine. It didn't, what Donald Trump discovered was the glee of hatred, was this extraordinary way in which he could sort of transcribe, transpose really, the sort of the visceral aggression, the adrenaline rush of taking on enemies, the hit of brutal rudeness, which is his bread and butter on The Apprentice, and actually turn it into political capital. So the issue, you, you run an institution with the thinks again when you're talking so eloquently about the difference with 1974 and Fox News not being there. You know, fixtures like David Brinkley and your paper, the Washington Post and so on, they were sort of like political church. They were sort of accepted as, you know, reliably transparent and so on. Yeah. And now the hit, which means where advertisers are going to put their money, is on the rush of celebrity wildness almost. Yeah. It's almost, almost like that. Yeah. So uh, the, the, the worrying thing is actually the kind of, the intoxication of hatred is such an extraordinary issue in American politics. How does something as serious and judicious um, as the New York Times deal with that? I'm not, I'm not asking you to turn yourself into a kind of cabaret of liberal joy or something. On, on the other hand, it's not a bad idea. Um, <laughs> but do, do you think, you know, how do you fight back again, against that? Because that's what Hannity, and, and Ann Coulter and Laura Ingraham, that's what they do, it's what Rush Limbaugh does. Rush Limbaugh yeah. is a great entertainer, alas. Yeah. So. You, uh, you very eloquently <laughs> captured the issue. Um, and it's, it's really difficult. I mean, I can tell you what weapons I think we have. I, I can tell you my honest belief is that over time we win. Um, because, to be frank, over time we usually win. I don't mean the press, but I mean the, 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 the press, the fact-based independent press has won every time. I mean, Richard Nixon attacked the Washington Post relentlessly. Everybody forgets how long Watergate lasted. It lasted like two years. The Washington Post was all by itself banging away. Um, Richard Nixon threatened their television licenses. It did not, now it looks like, oh my God, it was the nirvana of journalism. At the time, in the moment, it looked like one newspaper yeah. sloppily, I'm not, it wasn't sloppy, I'm just saying what the perception was, mm. sloppily, 
pushing against the tide. Mm -hmm. It took a long time for the New York Times and other news organizations to jump in to the fray. So my, my own view is that <coughs> I, think you, I think we win, if that's the right way to put it, by continuing to be independent, continuing to dig, continuing to report, going out in the country and talking to people who don't just live in New York or Los Angeles or San Francisco. Getting, talking to, what we, what we failed to do in 2016, by the way, is not doing enough of that. I think the, the anger, the, the sense of abandonment that you described that a lot of Americans felt that led, is one of the reasons Donald Trump won, one of the reasons that Americans wanted something dramatically different, I don't think we had a handle on, I don't think we quite understood the hangover from the, the financial crisis. I don't think we quite had our heads around the, you know, the, the effects of real income inequality in the sense that a lot of people felt that the rich got fixed after the economic crisis and they didn't. I don't think we had a handle on how much people were upset by the arrival of technology, the death of the industries they worked in. And I think that the, some of the elite press, to be frank, looked down on those people a little bit and, and, and didn't go out and say, trust me, Na I mean, we, we gave them the impression, even the American presidents, trust us, NAFTA is going to be good for you. I think if I, I believe, and this is my naive part, if we go out into the world, talk to those people, understand them, write about them, explain the world to them, and do it relentlessly for years, which is essentially what happened with Watergate. I think in that case, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to believe that truth wins out. I have to. You're going to do the, the same thing you've been doing, which is noble. No, not you know, quite. Not, not quite, because I, I don't think we did enough of that. I don't okay. think that we were, when I say transparent. But when you say, do you, when you, say you, you go out to Idaho or, you know. Um, Greenwich, Connecticut. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, Greenwich, Connecticut. Hopeless, <laughs> but, um, but when you go into the heart of America, uh, what is it you what is it you mean when you say we're going? I mean, you then write big, your magnificent double-page <coughs> spreads about that. But are actually the people who feature in the double spread, Joe and Jane Sixpack, actually in in you know where wherever it's going to be in somewhere in South Dakota? Are they actually going to be reading that? Or are they going to be listening to Sean Hannity and Rush Limbaugh? I think they're going to listen to Sean Hannity and Rush Limbaugh. Yeah. Um, but, I, but I also think that over time, when I say read us, I don't mean just the New York Times, by the way. I mean, I'm, I'm, right. I'm actually now speaking for the, for the industry I care about. I think that over time, look at what happened to Bill O'Reilly. Bill O'Reilly was seen as utterly invincible. The New York Times did a series of hard-hitting investigative reporting about Bill O'Reilly and, and, and the way he treated women at the station. Oh. The invincible Bill O'Reilly disappeared like that. Yeah. I'm not saying that's, that's the, but we, I think if yeah. that was truth one, truth beat Bill O'Reilly. Yeah. And we, Roger Eale. We, we want to hear from, I, I bet there are a lot of my working colleagues here, we want to hear your questions, but I have one more, Hannah, if you'll let me, one absolutely, the most important question of the evening, actually, to you, I think, very, very deep and important. Which is it to be, gumbo or jambalaya? Oh, gumbo, that's not even close. Yeah, but why, gumbo? That's not even a controversy, gumbo. right? Not even gumbo. controversial? No, gumbo, a is, a the, gumbo is the greatest American food creation and arguably <laughs> America's greatest artistic contribution to the world. Right. Take that out. <laughs> okay. Well, now it's time to hear from you, which you're pleased to do. And, wow, it is very hard. We have roving mics, so we also have paddles, too. And, oh, thank you, and the light's up a bit better. One and two, that, uh, even I can see that. I'm sorry, Hannah, say... Oh, the mic, the mics are wet? Oh, upstairs there are mics in the gallery, just there. Yeah, am I pointing in the right place? I'm hopeless at this bit. Um, but can we, can we take two questions? Is that all right, Dean? Can oh, we sure. Take anything, a bunch? Any, let's anything. take two. There's somebody over there anything. as well. Sure. So um, let's take question one and question two, if we could. 
Uh, hi, uh, thank you for the talk. You're not going to make uh, the jambalaya challenge, no, are no, you? I'm not no, I'm not. A jambalaya, really. <laughs> <laughs> um, we, we've spoken about Trump and we've spoken about Brexit, and it seems that's kind of the story of our generation, not our generation, this decade. Um, I work in climate change, and I sort of see climate change as a story of not this decade, but my lifetime. And at the moment in the British press, we're seeing it get a lot of attention. And I was wondering, do you see that in the US? And what challenges do you face covering a story like climate change, which is not a one-off event, but sort of ongoing for decades at a time? What challenges do you face? Yeah. Thank you. I'm going to take another question, then just okay. a second. Is that, is that OK? Where, where was I'll number answer. two? Yes. Uh, can you hear me? Okay. Um, there was some perception in 2016 that the New York Times and other publications uh, really didn't cover both Hillary and to the opposite Donald Trump in, <coughs> in equal balance. So you could talk about like Benghazi or her emails and you guys were somewhat aggressive in covering those but yet some of the things that Donald Trump did were so outrageous and there seemed to be an imbalance. Could you speak to that? Sure. Okay, two very important questions. Why don't I show you climate change? <coughs> climate change is the story of our generation. It just is. Um, and, it, and it calls on, you know, it, it calls on methods of reporting that, you know, it, 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 it crosses, you know, borders, obviously. Um, I, the, we have created a very large team to cover climate change. I decided, I made the decision to make it a primarily visual team. I thought that, I mean, I had a choice when, when a group of editors put their hands up to pick somebody who would, who would champion long form journalism about climate change or somebody who would champion visual journalism about climate change. And I, and I leaned toward visual because I think that that's the kind of story it is. Um, I think that my goal is to relentlessly get to the point where we can put that story in front of people almost every day, if not every day. Um, and, if we can, and if we can get really good at covering the natural disasters that are taking place all across the world and put them in the context of climate change. Do I think that people are starting to hear it? I actually do. I, I, th I actually think if you, I, I spend a lot of time in California because our son lives there. I think if you drive along the 405 and you look up into the hills and you see a fire, and you know that that's now going to happen every year, I think that climate change is starting to grip people. They may call it something else, but I think it's, it's already starting to grip the imagination. I do. I honestly do. Can, can I just add just a word before we yeah. go to that second question, if that, if that's all right? Um, I, 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 I would say one of the most um, immoral and catastrophically um, disastrous things that Donald Trump has succeeded in doing, really, is turning the Environmental Protection Agency into an enabling agency for polluters mm -hmm. and, um, and absolutely rolling back not, in, not just stuff that was done under Obama, but under generations, actually, of people who wanted to make um, the, the environment a central concern of, of, of government. Um, and that this is actually something, I don't know if you agree with me, Dean, that's something actually which I think um, whether we think about the poisoning of water in Flint, Michigan, or um, uh, emphysema in the coal mines, or wherever it is, it is actually something that can not be necessarily seen as an elite issue. Or even a, par um, or even a partisan issue. Yeah, exactly. So that this should be, you know, I hope as the election campaign yeah. warms up, it should be absolutely... I mean, there I would want you to deliver crushing... Uh, indictments, really, because yeah. it is something that's... No, that I, think, I, th I, I, I agree. I think this is a large story. I, think, I, I do think that, going back to the original point about Donald Trump's attacks on the press, I think, I think, I think in general, <clears throat> he attacks the sort of, I, I call them referees, the people whose job it is to call balls and strikes, and that's part of that is science. Yeah. I mean, science in, in yeah, many well, ways there, there is you are the again. ultimate. Yeah, uh, Donald so Trump when you deny the, climate oh, change, you're essentially attacking knowledge. the rough, yes. Knowledge, what we're facing, yeah. actually, in, our, in Britain as well, I think, is a war on knowledge. And one of the best predictors, <laughs> really, 
um, of how people are more or less populist is education. But we're yes. too embarrassed to say that for fear of being accused of elite. Yeah. The point at which science is actually demonized as elite, we are screwed, really. Yeah. It's a sort of global catastrophe, I think. And I just want to deliver a little pat on the back, actually. Um, Dean referred to visual journalism. Um, uh, climate change photography has become absolutely magnificent. No, it's, it's, I mean, you're doing what Life magazine, I guess, once did. No, but that's the goal. More, and it's really, it, it, if, if, if goal. some of you haven't seen it, it's, 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 it's really goal. quite extraordinary. And this to, to lady, answer this, the, this, this lady is a very question. important question. Yeah. <clears throat> I, 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 do, I do think there were, my view is what we did not do well enough in the 2016 election was, was cover the country, and I've talked about that. Um, which I consider, you know, I think that was a mistake. I don't mm. buy the criticism that we weren't aggressive enough on Donald Trump. I mean, we, we wrote the first stories about the same Megan Toohey, who ultimately was the co-author of the Harvey Weinstein story, was the co-author, along with Michael Barbaro, actually, of the first story um, that said that Donald Trump had been accused by multiple women of... of Saying, and saying things and behaving in ways that were inappropriate. We were the first ones to get hold of Donald Trump's taxes. We wrote about his taxes. We wrote about his business failings. I, 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 don't, I don't think we've been soft on, we were softer on Donald Trump, to be frank, than we were on Hillary Clinton. I, w one of the things that we get criticized for the most, which I'll confront, is the email story. And every time I, I say this, people run for the door. Um, or, or throw things at me, usually hide after I say it. I think her emails were an important story. She was, there was a federal criminal investigation into the person who at the time was the leading contender for President of the United States. And I think to have ignored that and to have not covered it in a large way feels to me like it would have been a political act and not a journalistic act. Um. Where are we? Uh, anybody, anybody up top, actually, or should I be? No, I don't want to miss anybody. Oh, is there somebody up top? Yes, you want to, I can't see you at all. But why didn't you fire your question? Uh, can you hear me? So my question is about reporters and producers covering the story every single day. How do you keep motivated when it's it's fatiguing every single day. It's a drip drop of information. You cover it, you move on. You come into the office the next day and you're covering the same exact story with one new development. How do you keep moving the, the stories forward? How do you not just, sometimes it looks the same on air. It looks mm -hmm. the same sometimes in the written form. How do you keep motivated? Mm -hmm. um, I think you could probably tell if, there, if I have many flaws as a, as a um, as a leader, and I suspect there are people here in this room who work with me who could list them, but lack of enthusiasm is not one of them. Um, I, I, look, this is one of the most historic eras in journalism. It is certainly the most historic of my lifetime. The stories are big. The stakes are large. The way we tell stories are so different. And I, I feel like I, I want to keep reminding my staff of that. I want to keep reminding the staff. And, and actually, it doesn't take that much. They get it. Yes, it's exhausting. The Washington Bureau, which I visit frequently, is exhausted. They've been covering this story nonstop for two and a half years. I've added people to the Washington Bureau. I've tried to put in new people. But in the end, people like Elizabeth Bumiller, who run the Bureau, she understands that she is covering the story of a lifetime. And she understands that years from now when she's doing whatever else she's doing, because she won't be a journalist 20 years from now, she understands that this is a big, giant moment. And that keeps people much more motivated than you would think. What kind of discussion do you have about headlines? Sorry, I'm hogging yours now. I'm the last <laughs> question now. Of headlines. I was struck the, just yeah. the other day by the fact, and it, I, it definitely wasn't a headline, um, that when Donald Trump, uh, when, when they, the foundation, Joke Foundation, agreed to pay $2 million, and <laughs> so it's discovered that none of the charities that were ostensibly yeah. 
people. One of them <laughs> was a charity for veterans, actually, that yeah. he'd, in effect, embezzled, or at least he transferred money for veterans um, you know, to his own campaign, really. And that was discovered more or less on Veterans Day. <laughs> that, that would have been a front page story for me if I'd have been you. Yeah. Um, you mean literally headlines, or why did we... Well, I that? certainly, a front page story. <laughs> I, you know how I think about, there are a lot of front pages now, right? When I started, there was one front page. The home page is a front page. Um, you know, what we decide to feature on the daily is a front page. I, I, I feel like one of my, I, I can't allow myself to think of only one way to tell people what we think are the most important stories of the day. Because if I do that, I'm going to have this perfectly, and we used to do this, <laughs> a perfectly crafted front page and a mess every place else. Truth be told, many, 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 many more time, more people read us on their phone or listen to the daily than have ever looked at the front page of an American newspaper. So I want that front page to be great. It's important to me. It's important to the country. It's like the final draft of what we do. But I got to pay attention to all the other stuff, too. Mm. Um, let's do a, a couple of questions. So are there two? Who's number one then there? Um, yes. Oh, would you? Yes, thank you. Yes, thank you. Hello, um, thank you for such a great talk. Um, I'm a training journalist, um, just getting into journalism, starting the course in January. Um, my question is more focused towards your youth audiences um, and you know, the, the subject of this talk, the future of news. Um, looking at the future of news... Could you, could you talk more into the mic? I don't know sorry. Um, sorry yeah. Yeah, lo looking at the future of news and the rise of popularism um, with you know, that combined with youth audiences being completely disengaged with news. Where do you see, you know, the direction of the New York Times going to cater to a more youthful audience? Um, and how, if, you know, there, there is a strategy for that, how, how do you see AI being a part of that? Um, <clears throat> so I'm going to take another one, Dean, as well. Yes, Second oh, question. Okay. Sorry. I hope I don't forget uh, them. Uh, I've um, sort of done my journalism. Uh, I worked for CBS, NBC, BBC, quite progressive outlets. And I'm, uh, one of the things I've noticed in newsrooms is how they've become polarized as nations have become polarized. America is extraordinarily polarized at the moment. And I'm concerned that progressive media is not helping the healing of the nation. It is uh, poisoning the well further by not reaching out to the other side. If I looked at the BBC newsrooms, I think there would be extremely few Brexit voters, yet half the country voted Brexit. If I was to look at the New York Times newsroom, I'd expect very, very few indeed to have voted for Trump. And I think it's almost impossible in story selection and in how you cover those mm. stories to be uh, holding truth to power when newsrooms are coming from one side of the fence or the other in Fox News, New York Times, CBS News, and the rest of it. I think it's an impossible job. Until there is more uh, pluralism in newsrooms, I think the situation is lost, however hard you try. I, know, I, I'm, I don't know if you, this will surprise you, but I agree with you. Um, I mean, I want the newsroom of the New York Times to not be monolithic. I want the newsroom of the New York Times to include, and, and, and over the last couple years, as the economy has gotten better and I've been able to hire, you know, I've hired veterans, um, I've hired people who, who, live a, who live in different worlds, who come from different places. I've intentionally, I hired a religion writer who comes from a religious background. I agree with you. I think that newsrooms in general are too, you know, lean one way. And I think, and I, think I want a newsroom. <clears throat> By the way, that also includes I want a newsroom that has more women. I want a newsroom that has more people of color. I want a newsroom that looks like the country I'm supposed to cover. And I completely agree with you, and it's gonna take a while to get there, right? People don't leave the New York Times. You have to hire as people leave. Um, the good news is we've hired a lot in the last two or three years, and the people who have we, if we have hired in the last two or three years, if they were themselves a newsroom, they would look very different than the traditional newsroom of the New York Times. I agree, that to me is like a lifelong, that's one of those things you don't stop. That's like education. 
you constantly build a newsroom that looks different, that looks like the country, that challenges you. I, I completely agree with you. Um, as to the question about the future of news, <clears throat> two things about young people. First off, the reason all of us jumped up and down at the possibility of having the daily is because the audience for the daily is significantly younger than the audience for the rest of the New York Times. So to me, that's a way to reach, it, it now has a billion downloads. That's a way to reach millions and millions of younger people, not only who can get their news from the daily, but back to the issue of transparency, who can listen to the daily, listen to how we do coverage, listen to how we work, humanize our reporters, and hopefully subscribe to the whole thing. Um, you asked about AI, right, and the role of AI. <clears throat> I mean, I'm not, this, is where I'm, this is where the English major in me is gonna, is gonna show the limits of my knowledge. Uh, of course, I think all of us are thinking about ways artificial intelligence not, not will influence the way we, I, don't, I personally, I don't think cover the news, but present the news. I think, that there, of course, there will come a day. One of the things we're gonna all have to learn to do is present a news feed on the phone that looks different to different people. You may not wanna read nine Trump stories at the top, whereas my readers in New York do. You may wanna read three Brexit stories. You may wanna read something else. So I do think that over time, artificial intelligence will make that easy, easier for us to do, and I've just hit the wall of my knowledge about artificial intelligence. <laughs> Um, lots of questions. Take one from the back there, number three, and um, and oh, and yes, <laughs> thank you. Do shout out. So, so yes. Okay, is it on? Yeah, all right. Yeah. I want to go back to impeachment, and we now know, and it's not surprising that what we've got are facts and evidence on one side, and on the other side ridiculous conspiracy theories, obfuscation, disinformation, confusion. So when you talk about your paper, Striving for Independence, how are you going to cover that particular story? Do you feel you have to give the same amount of time and credence to crazy conspiracy theories? <laughs> no, of course not. <laughs> So no. Can we take the question again up yeah. there and double? Oh, you want two at a time? Yeah. But the answer to that is no, and I'll elaborate. <laughs> uh, thank you. Uh, very interesting. Um, I'm, I'm in a privileged position that I work in technology as a supplier to Will the you New explain York. AI to a... No, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, I, I, I am a supplier of technology to the New York Times, Washington Post, many of the world's leading uh, quality news organizations. I'm fascinated with the Facebooks, Googles that you alluded to earlier. Uh, and the sort of uh, pillaging, if you will, of information of a personal nature uh, that they use as um, you know, wealth in many ways, as the you know, data is the new oil. Um, and, I, and I particularly, um, in the New York Times, perhaps over and above any other news organization in the world, I see a lot of editorial uh, fighting for the rights of privacy of data it seems to be a, a very key theme uh, coming out of the New York Times and Mark Thompson and the editorial uh, side of the paper that, um, that that is something that they're troubled by and don't buy into. And perhaps from that, that technology giant race to uh, promote news versus more quality journalism, I'm interested in that concept of but data the question, and privacy. The question is? So, the, so forgive me. The question is um, your position on privacy and data. Ah. Um, okay. <laughs> um, I, I, I'm trying to Which remember Which order you want to take up? They're um, both hot potatoes. Let me start. I'll start, start with this one. The hottest potato. Yeah. I, I, don't, I, I, I don't think being independent means elevating falsehoods to the level of truth just to show artificial balance. That's not, that's not at all what I mean. I do not think, I, have no, I feel no obligation in a story about climate change to find you know, one of the three or four scientists who are willing to make the case um, that climate change is irrelevant. I, I don't, I don't, that to me is not what independence means. What independence means to me is not assuming, for instance, that people who are religious are somehow 
different or, or should be looked down upon? That people who, who are not as well educated as the people who populate most major newsrooms are somehow to be treated differently. That to me, that, that to me is, it also means, which upsets people, that sometimes we investigate people who people think we might be more politically aligned with. It means that you don't become beholden to anybody in power. And when I, one thing I say often is, I do not want to be part of the resistance to Donald Trump. That's a political act. I want to cover the hell out of Donald Trump. But the problem with becoming part of, of the resistance to anybody is the resistance always wins in America. Eventually, there will be another liberal president. Eventually, there will be a president who will attack either Donald Trump himself or whatever he leaves behind. And I don't want to be aligned with that person either. I want, I want to ask hard questions of that person too. That to me is independence. It's not false balance, it really isn't. Do we slip sometimes into false balance on deadline in the name of, of trying to be fair? Of course we do. You could, I could pick up today's paper and find examples. Those are, but, but the, in terms of the core of what we want, I'm, I'm, I'm with you. But I think, I think the lady, uh, uh, if I'm putting words in your mouth, um, you will tell me, was saying, that's all very nice and good, but actually isn't the place of the paper also as a gatekeeper of truth to say, here on the one hand is something we call evidence, here on the other hand is feverish lunacy. Sure. And, and we may not use quite the language. Most of our, we have great writers, not all of them are as eloquent as, <laughs> as you are. Or, or as moderate. You know. <laughs> yeah. um, the, the, que the question here was position on the platforms. This is one of the things I always... I always have to stress, I run the newsroom of the New York Times. I don't run the opinion, pa the opinion pages. Um, so of the 1,700 or 1,600 um, journalists at the New York Times, the 15 or 1,600 of them work in the news side, and another 100 or so work in the opinion side. So I don't express a public view of privacy, and I also don't try not to express a public view of Facebook and its role in society, because I'm the person who has to, I mean, we worked with The Guardian to do some of the earliest Cambridge Analytica stories. My job is to cover them as big, powerful players on the scene who have tremendous impact on the world. And I let my colleague James Bennett, who runs the opinion pages, sort of opine about privacy. That, I feel like that's his role. And you should get him to come here. He's great. Um, some, some number one, and... Feels like um, an auction. Yeah, I know, I love it, yes. Number one and number three, back there. Oh no, we'll come to number two. Where is number two? Sorry, I realize I've been turning, maybe... Okay, um, where, yes, yeah. so let's do number one, number two, because my back has been turned to you, and I apologize for that. So let's do, yes, number two first. Yeah. Sorry. Um, um, as a subscriber, I do look forward to my email every day that has the links to the New York Times. And what I really wanted to ask about is you do a lot more coverage of international news than I expected from um, a, an American paper. And I, I'd just like to know in you terms said I of- You missed a word. You said we do more yes, or- more. Than I expected. More. Okay. Yeah. Um, we had tend to have a view that the US is quite parochial um, and you do a lot more coverage. I'm just wondering if with the rise of popularism, you think it's more important to cover that Nationally, as we see Turkey, we see Brazil, we see those sort of places start to become much more, I, sh I would say, you know, sort of popularist. Um, and how important is the coverage of international news in the New York Times? And then we'll take yeah, so one, there was another. I always yes. worry I'm going to yes. forget and the first gentleman question. Gentleman here. Thank you for the opportunity. Uh, I am an intern of the most read Hungarian independent news website, and I'd like to ask how you uh, see from the United States the independent media and the situation of the independent media in post-communist countries. In, in where? I'm in sorry. Post-communist countries oh, yeah. in, in okay. Eastern okay. Europe. Okay, okay. two Thank great you. questions. So they're okay. linked, rather. Yeah. I, I think inter international news for us has always been among, among the most yeah. important news. You know, it, it is our biggest department. It's the place where we put a tremendous amount of energy. 
I think we've done that historically. We do it even more now. Our London office is giant. The Hong Kong office is giant. And the reason is, I don't, I think, I don't, think, the, I don't think these are stories. The biggest stories of our time are not American stories or British stories. Climate change is, which is the existential story of our time, crosses boundaries. Everything that I've said, everything we've said about Donald Trump and the rise of populism can be said about the, whole, the debates you all are having on Brexit. It's hard for me not to see relationships among these stories. And the rise of populism all over the world is akin to your Brexit debates. It's akin to the Trump debates. I think what I can offer, to be honest, I can't cover the day in and day out news of Brexit or, or, or anything in any country other than the United States. What I hope I can do, what I strive to do, is to do two things. Pull back a little bit and help, help readers understand how these things are all connected and help them see beyond their borders. And then take on the stories that, you know, like the story we just did from, about the EU, about Brussels and spending, or the, or the story about Notre Dame, to take on the stories might, that are really, really large. So international coverage is, is, is part of the lifeblood of the New York Times. Um, I'm gonna confess, I don't, I, don't, I mean, I have, I have met with editors um, for those institutions. I don't feel I have enough information, to be honest, to judge them or to talk about them other than second or third hand, so I would be, probably be a little uncomfortable going there. Um, one number three at the back there, and then this gentleman at the front. Hi. Um, you said that you think the electronic media is significantly better than the print. Um, yes. Could you speak a little more into the mic? Uh, sorry. I'm not as eloquent as both of you. But uh, you said that you think the electronic media is significantly better than the print because of the connections um, it helps to build. But I think part of those connections means that you, know, you, you add legitimacy to like, falsehoods that you alluded to earlier. For instance, last week when you know, Gordon Sarnan um, revised his testimony, he's branded a traitor immediately. And so when you say that you think if Watergate, the scandal is going on now, that you know, it would have potentially a different outcome. Do you not think that rings alarm bells for the direction of the press and the way the news is going today? Should I answer or wait for the next? Um, yeah, okay. there was a gentleman. Yeah. Oh, so, so, sorry, I'll, I'll come to you next. Um, oh, sorry. Got to stand up. Um, working as a journalist, one thing we're always talking about is the future of journalism, obviously. And it seems like the New York Times and the Guardian have got the subscriber model down. At the same time, we've the, seen the Guardian actually doesn't have they, their their model is different. They don't have subscribers as much as they have sort of members and people who contribute. Just okay. Um, but then we've seen BuzzFeed and Vice going through all these layoffs because they relied on internet advertising. Do you think we're heading to a point where journalism is going to be concentrated among fewer publishers? And if so, does that worry you, or do you think that that's a positive thing? So I'll do the electronic one first. Um, I didn't, I didn't, oh, I can only remember two at a time. <laughs> I didn't mean to imply that, I, didn't, I, I wasn't exactly saying that electronic or digital journalism was better than print. I think that's a matter of choice. What I meant to say is that journalism today, with its array of choices, with the mashup of skills, with the ability to combine video and words in a way we couldn't do before, with the ability to do graphics, and with the ability to show news in real time, is better than print. And I get all the flaws, but don't romanticize out the flaws of print. The flaws of print were were many. They were, you couldn't distribute past a certain point. You couldn't sell the daily New York Times in a spot quick way around the world. The kid, the kid I described in North Korea, he could, he, it got him in trouble, but he could read news and information and media from elsewhere. And my only point is I just want to make sure that we don't get so caught up in the, in the sins of the new era 
that we don't remember the old era had its own share of sins, and I say that as somebody who grew up in it, and we also don't embrace the fact that this is tremendous and better and explosive and more people can talk to each other, and not all those people are clan members who want to find each other. That, that was my, was my uh, main point. Um, I do fear that, that, the grit, that news will be concentrated in a handful of big, powerful news organizations. That makes me nervous. It makes me nervous, especially because of the decline of, um, <clears throat> of local news in the United States and everywhere else. I do, I, I don't want a world, I want a world where the New York Times thrives. I don't want a world where it's the New York Times and the Washington Post and everybody else in the United States is bad. And, and, you, and for you have BBC and maybe one, the BBC and maybe one other news organization. <clears throat> That's not great. I don't, I, don't, I, don't, I, I don't want that world. And I think that we, those of us who run big, powerful institutions that I, I would argue have turned the corner, I think have an obligation to help figure out how to keep that from happening. And that's sort of the, the mission and altruistic part of the job that makes it more than a business. But I don't know the answer yet. And we have time for just two more questions. There is this gentleman. Sorry? Okay, well, uh, th this gentleman's been very patient, and then I'll take yours up there, and th that, I'm afraid, I'll have to be a, yeah. Hi, I'm Maria, and politics uh, postgrad at the London School of Economics, so thank you for your hopeful outlook on the future of media, something I uh, happen to agree with. This year, Scott Pelley in his book discussed the importance of the responsibility of individual citizens to fact check and think about what they share on social media and with their friends make sure they're getting their information from reliable sources. How does the New York Times approach the important topic of media literacy and encouraging people to be responsible before they spread information? Thank you. And question from up top. Related to that, so I work in technology and I study recommender systems. Uh, and nowadays we get a lot of our news from recommender systems from social networks, which tell us what what to consume, what information to read. And uh, besides the nice effects of personalization, there are the rabbit hole effects, the echo chambers, and uh, radicalization. And I was wondering, do you uh, think that the idea of an algorithm recommending news to people is flawed by itself? Or do you think that um, the uh, what, what properties uh, would you like these recommender systems to have? Um, I, don't, I, don't, I, th I think I'm an editor, so I would say this. I think that editors and human beings have to make the decisions about what the important news is of the day. I, I just believe in that. I mean, I, I, we, we, I don't believe algorithms should make those, those determinations for people, for, and not just because of ego, um, partly it's because I, I, don't, I don't think those decisions should be made on purely economic reasons, for one example. I would hate for the news feed of the New York Times to sort of make the decision, here are the 10 stories that, that here are the only 10 stories people want to read and we're not going to cover the other stuff. I think that sort of will get us in trouble. I don't mind, I mean, I, I actually think personalization, the fear of personalization, which for those who don't, it's a, it's where your news feed might look a little bit different than mine than his. As long as the core news of the day is there, that doesn't bother. Nothing's more personalized than the printed newspaper, right? You and I, if you and I were having dinner and I decided to read the sports section and you decided to read the culture section and you like book reviews and you know, I want to read something else, that's personalization. You've got my data set all wrong. <laughs> so I don't, I, don't, I don't mind that. And to be frank, nobody's going to come to the New York Times for the Kardashians anyway. We don't even know how to do that. Um, so, but, but the rest of personalization, I don't, I, don't, I don't think that's so bad. As long as we, as long as I would argue, human beings give you the core news of the day. Um, in terms of media literacy, that's a big question. Um, I'm, I'm personally involved in one group that's, that's spent a lot of time and energy on media literacy. I don't think it should be up to just to news organizations to sort through all of the crap that's available. I think that's folly. First off, there are not enough news organizations, there are not enough editors, 
and the amount of information that flows into the world every day is just astronomical. There's no way we can do it ourselves. I, I, I do think, and I'm, I'm actually stealing a line from my friend Steve Adler, who's the editor of Reuters, because I was on a panel with him um, today, and he spoke so passionately about it that I agree with him, but I'm going to steal his, his language. I mean, he made the case that, in fact, we have to teach the same way we taught people to, in, in history classes to understand the difference between primary and secondary sources, as Steve put it. I think we're going to have to teach students and kids to understand the difference between fake news, stuff that's made up, and real news. I think we're going to have to teach them to understand why some sources are reliable and some aren't. I don't think we have a plan to do that. It's really ambitious, but I think it's like vital because if you're going to depend on news organizations, the, the shrinking number of news organizations to do all of that for you, that's just not going to work. Mm. Well, um, I have to say, um, this has been, a, for me anyway, a very heartening evening. You've batted away my sour skepticism and, uh, you know, this has been anything other than a funeral for uh, our vocation as journalists and great news organizations. In fact, you've given us uh, a lot of hope and fortitude and good cheer and inspiration. And um, uh, in dramatic contrast, most of the stuff we hear from the United States government and the White House. So thank you for that. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.